please welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Gregory Clark. Thank you. So unequal chances or unequal abilities, this is the timeless question about people's social position. And to think about that, we need to think about just one number, which is what is the correlation between parents and children on any measure of social status, such as income, wealth, education, uh, employment status. And if it, that number is zero, it implies that the parents predict nothing about the children, that every generation is born anew, we have a world of complete mobility. Now, of course, this is not something that parents in Sonoma are going to welcome. Uh, <laughs> if the number is one, <laughs> in contrast, it implies that we live in a world of complete uh, rigidity, where parents uh, pass on to their children all of their characteristics, and where there's everyone, uh, there's a class society where generation after generation, people stay in the same place. Now, there's a conventional picture of mobility that can be portrayed in the picture that is shown here. And this just shows a set of countries now ranked in terms of how much income inequality they have, but on the vertical axis, what we show is the intergenerational correlation of income. And this picture shows a lot of variation across societies in terms of income inequality and also in terms of the closeness of that correlation between parent and child in terms of income. And this picture actually suggests three very powerful things. The first thing is that as conventionally measured, social mobility rates are actually very high. In the Nordic economies, which had these very low intergenerational correlations, almost all of the characteristics of children are not predictable from parents. As I say again, for people sending their kids to school in Sonoma, this is not something they want to hear. Uh, but it does imply that there's just a lot of flexibility, even in the United States, which is in the middle of the picture. What you're actually seeing is that of the variation in outcomes in terms of income for children, less than a quarter is actually explained from the parents. Three quarters of that is some other type of uh, input that's coming from society. The second important implication is that there really is a social mobility problem. Because if Nordic societies, which are successful and well-functioning, can have intergenerational correlations as low as 0.2, it implies that in all other societies, which have much higher correlations, there must be a lot of people through the accidents of their birth who are trapped in positions that don't fully utilize their potential talents and potential abilities. And so there really is a need for societies to think about how to increase the rate of social mobility. And then the third implication is that what overwhelmingly is going to matter to social success is culture or education or social networks. Genetics must play very little role in actually determining people's outcomes. Now, in research that I've done over the past five years and which exploited the fact that one of the things we inherit from our parents is our surname, and use that to measure social mobility over as much as 10 generations by looking at what's happening to the status of surnames, what we find surprisingly is that these conventional estimates that I showed you are somehow missing a huge amount of social rigidity. The underlying correlation of status turns out to be as high as 0.8. And while there's a lot of flux at the, the individual level, it turns out in the long run, there's a very great deal of persistence in terms of social status. And then the second very surprising thing is that that persistence is actually just the same in modern Sweden as it was in medieval England. <laughs> we haven't actually managed to improve social mobility rates beyond what they were in 1300. And then the third thing that's also interesting is 
that the patterns of persistence we see in the name data is quite consistent with genetics actually being the major carrier of social status, and with a lot of people's status being determined by the time of their birth. So, if you want to read more about this, which I don't have time to talk about now, then have a look at my book, uh, The Sun Also Rises, which was published in 2014. And once you actually see this pattern with the names, then if you go back to the social world, it turns out that you can see very clearly that there really is this enormous persistence. And so let's start, since we're going to talk about genetics, with the grandfather of all genetics, uh, Darwin. And it turns out that he has 27 great-great-grandchildren, or had 27. That's four generations later. If the mobility rates I quoted to you in that first picture are characteristic, those great-great-grandchildren -grand should not be that much different from the average person in the English population. It turns out that instead, his descendants were an incredibly distinguished group. It included a bunch of university professors, authors, painters, they did everything. A bunch of them didn't even have his name, so it's not that it was the name that gave them the status. Now, my economics department is a pretty good one. There's 30 of us, and we like to think we're ranked in the top 40 in the world in terms of economics departments. We're less distinguished than Darwin's great-great-grandchildren. <laughs> Well, the only thing we know about them is that they're descended from Darwin himself. And so it turns out that the social world has a lot of rigidity. What seems to happen is that people have a kind of status phenotype, which is in rapid flux between generations, but underlying this is a status genotype, which is being passed on much more faithfully. And so if you're high status and your kids don't do so well, what's interesting is you can predict that the grandchildren will bounce back <laughs> because of this <laughs> status genotype that's passed, right? And it also predicts if you want to marry someone and produce high-quality kids, you want to find someone who's down on their luck this generation, <laughs> but was up on their luck <laughs> in the previous generations, these are the bargains on the marriage market, right? <laughs> and so the question that still remains, though, is what transmits that social genotype? Is it really just resources, culture, and networks, or could it actually be genes that determine people's social position? Now, the surprising evidence, and a lot of this is rehearsed in my book, is that most status transmission is at least highly consistent with genetic transmission. What I'm going to talk about now in the minutes we have left is just a little bit about the patterns of inheritance. But adoption studies, groups that marry endogamously so that you only ever marry within the same group, how elites get formed and shocks to family size, all are very consistent with the idea that it really is genetic inheritance that matters here. So what about patterns of inheritance? If status is genetically inherited, then you get some very interesting predictions about what these patterns will look like. And one very surprising one is that the correlation between parent and child will be the same as the correlation between siblings. And that's very surprising, because if you think it's the environment or the family culture stuff that matters, you would think that the siblings will be very highly correlated, much more correlated than they will be to the parents. To take an example, I'm one of four siblings. We were treated identically by our parents. On the other hand, my parents both had very different family environments from the one that we had. And so you would think that if these things matter, siblings will be very much alike, parents and siblings will be more different. And the other thing that you'll find is that the cousin correlation should equal the parent to grandchild correlation. And in fact, for any two relatives in the family tree, you get a predicted pattern of correlation. And what, uh, with, as I say, with culture, resources, and networks, you would, this will not happen. So what we're currently doing is constructing a data set to test whether genetics fits with a pattern of correlation. And so far, we have 67,000 people in England with rare surnames, so we can track them through the records. 
born from 1750 and later. And we actually use a lot of crowdsourcing on this because a lot of people have plotted their own family histories, and we can actually borrow that and then contribute it to our database. And we have then people across seven generations. We have multiple outcomes for these people, including their house value in 1998. <laughs> and when we do that, and a sample of our database looks, as is illustrated here, is very complex. There's an incredible set of, of linkages. What happens to the father-son versus the brother correlation? It exactly meets that genetic prediction that it should be the same between siblings as it is between fathers and sons. So occupational status is the most strongly inherited thing. It's also true for siblings as well as fathers and sons. And then lifespan is quite weakly inherited, but it's the same for siblings as well. And so it meets that first uh, uh, criteria. The next criteria will be that if we plot people here in terms of their genetic distance, that should completely predict what the correlation in status will be. And so here we're showing the correlation in wealth as a function of distance and status. Now, once you get to the point of second cousins, most people don't know who their second cousins are. They've never met them. Certainly, the third cousins, you have no idea. <laughs> What's amazing in this picture is that it exactly fits the predictions of the genetic model. And what it implies for all of you is that there are people out there in the world who are mysteriously linked to you in terms of social status, <laughs> who you've never met, <laughs> never interacted with, but if you're poor, they're poor also. <laughs> and that there is this mysterious connection. And as I say, once you get to third cousins, you're talking about going seven steps down the inheritance tree. And so you're really talking about people who uh, are going to be quite distant from you in terms of their connections. Now, what's the implications of all of this for our lives? <laughs> Some people look at this and would say, this is the most depressing thing you could possibly tell me <laughs> on a nice afternoon in Sonoma. I actually, since I'm Scottish, uh, I actually read it much more optimistically. <laughs> and. <laughs> And what it says to me is that the world is actually much more meritocratic than we assumed. It may be the case that at birth, you, that's when the, the, the dice is cast, but it, it, it means that we actually live in a world where parents actually are able to do much less than we think to change the outcomes for their children. And so in that sense, <laughs> uh, the reason I say it's, it's not a pessimistic result is go home the, tonight and relax. <laughs> it's all done already. But the only thing that this does imply is that we should certainly try and limit the degrees of social inequality within any society if the die really is cast at the beginning. Thank you very much.